Okay, we're now in episode 11G, and I'm going to backtrack a little bit because it was another line of tracing that I didn't cover and should. There is a pattern um, that has to do with Rome, and of course I've been saying that all along. And it's really easy to wonder, well, why is there all this focus on Rome? What about the rest of the world? Don't they count? Of course the rest of the world counts. The point is that Israel is in the center of the world. It is the nexus, see, 14, the nexus of three continents. There was a great deal of trade going on. Everybody was going to Rome at this time, and it was a very, um, how do you want to call it, convenient way for somebody who was interested in God they could find travel. They would have heard about the God of the Jews no matter where they were. If they were interested in God, God makes sure to put you in contact with. And if somebody wanted to know God in those days, you voted with your feet. Okay? And that's why there were so many people in Jerusalem when Christ was there. And that's why, you know, the book of Acts at Pentecost talks about everybody hearing the gospel in his own language. That's in Acts 1 and 2. Okay? So Rome is really the center because during the time, this particular time for Rome, and it was a small window, it, it was safe to travel. Rome made it safe to travel. Rome was essentially a very dull group of people who were very much interested in trade and a, a, a sort of dull life. That's how they got started. That's why they called themselves the Seven Hills. That's why Revelation 17 is definitely about Rome, because that was Rome's own name for itself. The Seven Hills reference the seven groups of people on those seven hills who eventually became the patriarchs of Rome. But in the beginning, they were simple peasants who did a lot of trading. They were pretty cruel. They were pretty dull. And they just believed in a lot of hard work, and they had really strong values about working hard. And that's how they became, you know, a great, you know, polity, in spite of the fact that Rome itself was a terrible place to live. It was full of marshes. The air wasn't good. That's why they lived on the hills, so they could get away from the stagnant air. And so this whole business about Rome being the center, it made for a peaceful Mediterranean at this time. Now, at the same time, Rome was not kind to Israel as it could have been, but sometimes it was nicer than others. And under Augustus, this is when Christ is growing up, Augustus was ruling for the better part of this period right here. Augustus made the Pax Romana, all right, because he he was real big on everybody having their own customs, and Herod was well, turned out ended up being uh, one of Augustus's best friends, although they were initially enemies because Herod had chosen on the side of Anthony. So Herod had legated the entire Judean territory to Augustus, and of course Herod died the same year as Christ was born, and that sets a trend that I didn't cover that I need to cover. Herod wanted to kill all the babies when he found out that Christ was going you know, to be born. Christ was born about four months, um, well actually he was born um, in Kislev of 4 BC, which is late in 4 BC, that's why we have to call it 3 BC, and then Herod would die the following Passover. Meanwhile, the child was in Egypt and then comes back out, you know, Matthew 2 and the dream and all that. Now, during this time, Augustus was ruling and he took over as a result of Herod dying. And Herod was sick a long time before he died, okay? Um, some say it was syphilis, something else, you know, there's a lot of speculation as to what it was he had. But he was very ill. 
for a long time, like several years before he died. So that's why they instituted the tax as a special thing under Quirinius, who was one of Augustus's best friends and even took care of his kids. Quirinius was a sort of roving ambassador, and so he could have plenty of potentiary powers, which is just like having governorship. And that's why Luke talks about Quirinius the way he does. And they had to come in because Herod was sick. Herod was sending in the taxes himself. Sometimes he wouldn't, he wouldn't even let the Jews pay the taxes. He would just pay it out of his own personal wealth. He was very wealthy. Okay, but Herod got sick in large measure because he was trying to persecute Christ. All right? And this happened sometime earlier than, all right, his actual death, and that's why Rome had to step in because Augustus was the beneficiary of the entire Judea. Herod was mentally ill, too. And he was against all of his family, they were against him, and everybody was intriguing, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Augustus took over, but he was really lenient for partly because he inherited the territory to the Jews because his big thing was, look, just give us the money and be peaceful and obey the laws. And they installed the Sanhedrin, you know, as the, as the local government, and they tried to stay out of affairs. Okay, they ended up, you know, sending in Pontius Pilate as a procurator. And after Augustus, there was Tiberius. And this is this period now, all right? And during the time of Tiberius, that's when, in 26 AD, is when uh, Pontius Pilate came in. And, you know, Judea was considered the armpit of the world. You did not want to go there. But if you did a good job, you could, you know, get a, a promotion. So apparently Pilate must have done something wrong in one of his other stations where he was. And so he, so he pulled duty in, in uh, Judea, and he didn't like it, of course, because it's really hard to manage the Jews at that point. And something he had done in 37 AD got him taken out. Of course, Pontius Pilate is famous for being the guy who presided over the execution of Jesus. All right? And everybody knows that story. I'm not going to resume it here. But this is the year in which he left. And again, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of nonplussed about how close this is tallying to the AD we use, since we usually have a three-year variance, and I can't explain that. I'm just going to say it the way it is and go forward. Okay, so Pilate is out at this point, and this is the same year in which Tiberius dies. I want to say it's the same year. Yeah, it is. Caligula comes to power at this point. Caligula was a young kid at the time, and he had too much going to his head. And Caligula got it into his head that he wanted to persecute the Jews. All right, Christ is already dead this time. There's all this stuff going on between the, the breakaway, so-called breakaway sect of, the sect of the Christians and the Jews. And, you know, they're all up in war with each other, but they're all kind of making nice with the Romans because they don't want to get in trouble with the Romans. But Caligula's a, a, a wacko. He's not wacko at first. But by 41 AD, which is just before he, well, not quite 41, like 39, late in 39, he gets it into his head that he's, he's a god and he's going to put a statue of himself up in the Jerusalem temple. And he has an advisor named Agrippa, who's related to the Herods, I forget in which way, um, who counsels him out of it. So at the last minute, he's counseled out of it. But you know what? The guy dies in 40, what, roughly 41 or so. Okay? That's when Caligula dies. Claudius comes to power at this point. I think I'm saying this in the right order. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Claudius, who was considered a stupid person, really wasn't a stupid person. He just had bad habits and, you know, he slurred and dribbled and did all kinds of things. He was married to a woman, I forget her name now, who um, had a, another son named Nero. And the woman he was married to was playing around on him and a bunch of other things. What distinguished Claudius, he was a very good administrator, actually. But one of the things he did do is he persecuted the Christians. He banished them from Rome. And you can find that in Suetonius. I think it's in Suetonius. I forget which of the, which of the ancient historians it's in. Anyway, he banished the, the, the Christians from Rome. 
Okay, Christians and I think some of the Jews too, but, but definitely the Christians. Okay, so Claudius is poisoned by his wife. And that brings our boy Nero to power. So here's the Claudius period, and it's, it ends right about here. Nero's about, what, 16, 17, something like that when he comes to power. And his, he's a mama's boy, and he's got all kinds of crazy things, and he himself is a wacko. And he gets it into his head, not entirely by his own being crazy, but he gets it into his head sooner or later, especially at this point, that he's going to blame the Christians. I think it's more political expediency than anything else. Okay, because Nero was a mix. He's not quite as wacko as Caligula was. Okay, but he's wacko enough. And he kills Paul. Okay, Paul has two trials before Nero. The first trial, Nero was relatively new in power. That was about 50. You know, Paul's waiting for trial at the time he writes this, which we call 58 59 AD. He's under house arrest in Rome, writing to the Ephesians. And that lasts until about 62 AD, and then he's released the first time. And then there's the fire at Rome, and he gets rounded up in 68 AD. He's killed. Okay, that's probably at the beginning of 68 AD, because Nero himself, okay, is, is made an enemy of the state. And in order to, say, to, to spare himself from having to be killed and dragged into the Tiber and a bunch of other things that the, the verdict was against him, he kills himself. Okay, you know, full of, you know, self-pity and all that. But that was June of 68 AD. I hope you're noticing a pattern here. Everybody who tries to hurt the Christians and everybody who tries to hurt the Jews, the same thing happens to them. Okay? And then that's followed up after Nero. Then you have the year of the four emperors. Oops. Oh, bloody hell. Excuse me. Then you have the year of the four emperors. And that's when, you know, Galba and Otho and Vitellius and finally Vespasian, who was investing Jerusalem at the time with his adopted son Titus, Vespasian finally comes to the throne around 69 or so. Vespasian is a whole change of pace relative to how they were persecuting the Jews. According to Josephus, and I, I, I think Josephus is reasonably accurate here because it sort of reflects the mindset of Vespasian. Um, Titus wanted to bring his dad, Vespasian, who was newly, you know, emperor. He wanted to bring him a triumph, but he didn't want to destroy the temple because Jerusalem was a commercial value, okay? So I really do believe that he didn't intend for the temple to go down, okay? But apparently, you know, the fire got started one way or another, and it ended up ruining Jerusalem, so he, he salvaged it as best he could, and that's where you got the freeze of Titus, and that's where you got the 90,000 prisoners, which I believe, because um, the Romans weren't that big on, they, they didn't like to exaggerate their prisoners, they were kind of sticklers for that, all right? And so he brought on home all that booty and a triumph, and, you know, you know everybody's on display, and then they, they, you know, go to the Via Appia, and then at the end, they end at the Mamertine Dungeon, and they kill, you know, the whoever they wanted to kill, and they sold off everybody else. Okay, but the Jews had a lot of commercial value to people, generally speaking. So they didn't kill too many of them, unless they had to. All right, because the Jews were recognized as being good soldiers, they were recognized as being good accountants, they were recognized as being good lawyers, they were recognized, you know, as being good teachers. They had a lot of talents, and for centuries they were used that way by conquering, you know, emperors and kings and whatnot. So Titus and Vespasian and Titus were relatively benevolent, even though it was Titus who sacked the temple. They were relatively benevolent. Titus ends up doing some persecution of the Jews, and he ends up dying. Um, I forget exactly when. Um, I want to say it was 79 AD, just after Pompey. 79, 81, somewhere in there. Okay, and then, oh, my memory, I'm talking straight off the top of my head, so you correct me if I'm wrong. I want to say after Titus was Domitian. And that's the guy I wanted to focus on anyway. Domitian was really 
upping up the the persecution of the Christians and the Jews. I don't know quite, you know, the taking down of the temple and the aftermath of it. And of course, there were a lot of people in Caesar's household um, who had converted to Christianity during Paul's time. Okay, Paul, of course, is dead here. The temple is dead here. And by this point, you know, this is the last years of Titus. And then in comes Domitian. And Domitian steps up the persecution. He exiles. The one of the things about his persecution, though, is he was a little bit judicious about it because of the popularity of Christianity. So he exiled John the Patmos. Exiled him. Didn't execute him. Okay. But the very year he the very year he ex exiles John is the year he dies. Okay. And that pattern continues. All right. After the mission. Um, that's when, uh, I want to say Nerva came, yeah, Nerva came into power. Nerva tried to, it was a double-edged sword, Nerva tried to, to, to sort of moderate things. And he's, instead of, you know, just persecuting, hi, let's get some economic value out of these people, he put a tax on the Jews so that they wouldn't have to, you know, uh, worship the Roman deities because the Romans viewed um, worshiping the deities, not really as worshiping the deities, but as as being honor uh, honoring to the state. So if you didn't honor the Roman gods, then you didn't honor the state. And they felt that if they honored your gods by letting every god of every province have some place in Rome to have as a temple, then they were honoring those gods, and they expected you to return in you know the favor and kind. In other words, it was a lukewarm you know, kind of not real faith in anything except that they were trying to honor the state. Okay, that would be, if you really, really believed in these gods, you were laughed at in polite society. Okay, but you had to go through the motions. That was Rome. Everything was surface and show and go through the motions and status and society and piety was observances, doing things, rituals. Okay, as long as you did that, they liked you. Okay, but the Jews refused to do that. That was one of the reasons why they kept on being persecuted. And Nerva said, hey, wait a minute. Let's just have them pay a tax, and then they don't have to observe our gods. If they'll pay the tax, they're doing what an honorable citizen ought to do in lieu of, you know, doing the observances. Because the money that was given to the temples was used for public works and stuff like that. So the Jews had to pay a tax, but the Christians didn't. And that was a double-edged sword because on the one hand, the Christians were regarded, therefore, as, as simultaneously more a part of Roman society than the Jews. But on the other hand, if they came out publicly as being Christians or made a big stink of it, they were either, you know, laughed at or they were definitely made fun of, especially in these days because this was when the mission, during the mission they had like mimes mime plays burlesquing Christians, and they were usually really rude, I mean, uh, obscene, okay, sexual. They had like little dinner parties, all, all of your patriarchal, you know, dinner parties. They would have these mime troops, and they would make fun of Christians. So you were not, you were persona non grata in society, okay. But at the same time, you were considered very much a part of Roman society. So if they, what they were trying to do is say, okay, hi, you can be a Christian. You don't have to pay the tax. But you know what? If you are a Christian, we're going to look down on you, and we might prosecute you. So you, they, the Christians kind of didn't get out of anything by being Christian. In other words, they didn't have to pay a tax. And by the way, we might prosecute you. Depends on how much you wore your Christianity on your sleeve. If you're quiet about it, then they let you alone. It's kind of like society today. All right? And that was the way it worked. But bear in mind, Domitian, who, was, who started this, and then Tr Nerva after him was a little more lenient. These people, these emperors died as a result of, or very close to, close enough and in a repetitive enough pattern where you have to say, you know what, I left them along left them alive just long enough so they could do their thing and then you know what time's up and that's what happened to Domitian here 
Nerva took his place. He wasn't in power very long. After Nerva came Trajan, and Trajan and Pliny, Trajan was about here, okay, uh, in this in this vicinity right in here. Trajan came after Nerva, and he didn't last too long either. Trajan was big on persecuting the Jews and persecuting the, the Christians, but only if they were like sticklers about it. In other words, he told Pliny, he said, look, you should punish them if they, and if they confess that they're Christians and they change their mind and accept them back into society, which of course never really works because everybody just laughs at you. They think you only, you know, renounced it just so that you could save your life. So they laughed at you. But if they do renounce, then you let them go. And, you know, don't ask, don't tell was the policy that Trajan gave Pliny. Because Pliny was writing to him, I think it was from Call or Spain, I forget exactly where Pliny was. So, but, but Trajan was still, and Trajan was one of the good, you know, these are the Antonines now. He, he still wanted to make sure the Christians, if, if they were obnoxious, okay, that they got, they got, you know, punished. Well, he didn't live too long. And then after Trajan came Hadrian, the Jews petitioned Hadrian, this is about right here, the Jews petitioned Hadrian to rebuild the temple. He said no, and that fostered the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which of course you've heard me cover three times now, which starts here, which is where we're going to end up picking up yet again, in here. And that lasted from 132 to 135 AD. Hadrian ordered that the city be raised and that Aelia Capitolina be built. Okay, and it was built by 140, but you know what? Hadrian was dead by then. He died in 138. You see what I'm saying? The enemies, it's our fault that stuff goes wrong. That's the other thing that, that Paul's explaining. Because as you're a believer, you've got this text in your head, and you're going through your history. You've got the people who, you know, this is third generation, fourth generation. Fourth generation is going through all this, and they got Paul, and they're like, Oh, wow, look how this is coming true. Well, you know what? If I want to benefit Rome, because after all, I'm living in it, and Rome is still the center because this is where Christianity got born, and we want to make sure that, you know, Christians are around so that they can witness, I better grow up in Christ so that Rome will be benefited because, you know what? It's not going too well right now. And of course, it, there was enough to generate the Antonines because it was this was the the golden period according to the historians. You know this whole period right here up until Commodus, which occurs right here. Commodus starts ruling with his dad Marcus Aurelius in 177. All right, but as you're going through this as a Christian and you're looking at this thing that Paul had done and you know your meter, and you had to know this history. You're seeing it play out. See? Here's his grace. I'm his son. This is happening due to me. This meant a whole lot in the Roman world. If you were the heir, you were the heir of everything. Okay, this is a special Roman, you know, it's in Greek, but Greek was the lingua franca of Rome. You know, they use Latin for legal stuff, and they use Greek for cultured speech, for daily speech and cultured speech. And they also used whatever the local language was. Okay, if you were an educated Roman, you spoke Greek. All right, so everybody spoke Greek, even the Galileans. All right, people saying that they only spoke one language is a big lie. Okay, they just didn't speak it well. You know, and they had a bad accent, basically. But everybody spoke Greek. Okay, this is a Roman idea with Greek words. Huiotesian, airship. It means you inherit the whole enchilada. That's who we are. So here you are going through this change of emperors. Here's, here's you know, you got, you got a change from Domitian to Nerva and then Trajan. And so you see them inherit the whole empire. And you're thinking, well, you know what? I'm the heir of Jesus Christ. See how meaningful this is when you know that it's history tied? And then... You know, Trajan goes, in comes Hadrian. Oh, I'm baptized into Christ. 
Hadrian was baptized, you know, as a, you know, the the Huiotesian for Trajan, okay? But I'm baptized in the Christ. And it's his own delight that I'm baptized. You see, this is really, really meaningful to the people living during this time. And they're watching the people who persecuted the Christians, the emperors who did it, who authored those policies, get axed shortly after they axed Christians and Jews. So when you get here, again, this is where Hadrian orders, you know, the put down of the Bar Kokhba, and he's not wrong to do that. That that was they they were really vicious, okay, just like the Jews were vicious here in '66. Of course, they had a nasty procurator at that time. Okay, I mean, you know, there's always blame on two sides. It's never one-sided. But when he orders this, well, he only lives another five years after that. He dies in 138, so he doesn't live to see the new pig temple go up. I mean, I'm assuming that 140 is when it actually went up. It was, he might have lived to see it and then shortly died afterwards. Okay? And so here you are living during this time, and now you are in diaspora. Remember, we covered what 133 was, Daniel 9 7. Israel's to blame, near or far. You are righteous, we are shamed faced, wherever you've sent us for our disobedience. We're wrong, you're right, God. That verse is coming to their mind as they're walking out, Jews and Gentiles alike, because the, they can't get into the city now. They were barred from it. And this is what you remember. He's glory of his grace. He's graced us out. We're in the beloved. See, this is almost like the Psalm 119 death march. Wherever they're going, they're going to remember this. Oh, huyote sion. See? Huyote sion. And in order to sweeten the pot even more, okay, to make it even more definitive, oh, should I go to the end or should I go to the beginning? Let me go first to the end and then I'm going to backtrack. We got right here, 175. Now I want you to notice something. We had talked in the, in the last, in 11F, I'd shown you how Paul benchmarked syllable 133 in Daniel, Isaiah, and um, Psalm 90. Here, he's also benchmarking, but he's only benchmarking Psalm 90. And I want to show you the verse because it'll blow you away. Okay? That's 175 AD. Bear in mind, Commodus has come into power. Commodus is the guy who really, you know, ends the Flavians. I think there were Flavians. I call them Antonines, but they were the Flavians at that point. Okay, um, isn't it the Flavians with Marcus Aurelius um, as his dad? Um, Marcus Aurelius was persecuting the Christians too. I should have talked about that, but I'll get to it. Let me first just go to 175. This is 175 in Psalm 90. Psalm 90, verse 9. And basically, what this is saying, pretty much like. 133, which is the last benchmark Paul made in Psalm 90. He says it's because all of our days turn in your anger, and all of our years end with a groaning sigh. And that's how people usually end their life, and that, especially with the Romans, that, that would, they were proud of ending their life that way. Oh, I gave my life for my country. And I didn't get anything for it. Oh, aren't I a good person? See how religious that is? Okay. And that's how a lot of people were thinking to. Okay. So you got this boundary of ending your years in anger at God and God judging you. And here we go. Our years end with a sigh turning in your anger. Okay. In other words, they're not believing they're not listening, and of course they go out into diaspora, and so the believers who are negative, as well as all those who don't believe, and those who were used to 
punish, like Hadrian, they end their years with a sigh too. Meaningless, pointless, ennui. Okay? Now, as I had said before in 11F, you got dying and birthing, a cycle, palindromic nexus, an ending, giving birth to a new generation in a new place, debt cancellation, baby. We, it's going to cause his glory of his grace. Grace us out in the beloved. This is what you remember if, as you're being persecuted, what you remember as you're moving out, what you remember as, you, as you're growing up. This is all happening to us, and we're watching it live because Paul told you in advance how it was going to play right here. Okay, and again, he's quoting Psalm 90, 90 verse 9 there. Now, the other thing that he's been doing all along that I didn't spend enough time in is when I said he was, he was benchmarking this also to syllable 133 in Isaiah. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to have to tell you this because I did videos on it where I showed how, how Isaiah did this in my Isaiah 53 um, meter hypothesis playlist. I started to show you how Isaiah is benchmarking history syllable by syllable starting with Hezekiah in Isaiah 53 1 and by the time he gets to the end of Isaiah 53 2 which is syllable 133 that that verse if you're not familiar with it already says um, no sight of him will we desire. We won't find him attractive. He won't, he won't, I, I think one of the translations says, we won't regard him as comely. That's an old fashioned word for good looking. Okay? He won't be attractive to us. And really what it says is, no sight of him do we want. We don't want anything to do with him. And it's really strong in the Hebrew. Okay? Hamad means to desire something like, <laughs> okay? You live for it, you long for it, you want to be around it. And so if it's lo hamad, which is what the text says, it means, honey, I don't want nothing to do with you. You are totally disgusting to me. That's how they thought of Christ. Nivzeh, wa chadal ishim. Nivzeh means to despise. Chadal means to, to forsake, to abandon. No, we don't want anything to do with you. That's how the verse in Isaiah 53, 2 had started. And how it ends with, we don't want anything to do with you. And the ending is syllable 133. Now, in the Isaiah 53 playlist where I go through this, Isaiah was doing just what Paul is doing. Of course, Paul is aping Isaiah. Isaiah was doing an annual year-by-year -year chronology from Isaiah 53, 1 forward of the future history of Israel. That's why Paul is doing what he's doing with the future history starting here. This is the first year where he's going future of the church. That's where he's getting it from is Isaiah. Okay, so when he ties pregnantly to syllable 133, Isaiah at that point in his future chronology was telling you how Manasseh would end up. And Isaiah was writing it in 712 B.C. Okay. So he's writing before Manasseh is even born. And he's telling you Manasseh is going to end up. And he, he, I benchmarked it and I showed you how Daniel plays off Isaiah in the, um, the page 5 of this document. The, the pieces that are that I the web pages that I list and the word docs that I list on Daniel and Isaiah go through those because Daniel benchmarks to Isaiah and you can see it in that part of it especially at syllable 133 which Daniel also benchmarks to Isaiah was just wrapping up the the kingship of Manasseh and it was due to the kingship of Manasseh. I want to say it's in 2 Kings 21. It might be 1 Kings 21. I get those two books mixed up. God says in somewhere in the middle of that chapter, he says, due to Manasseh, the temple is going down. 
no matter what. And he says it like four times. And it's repeated again in Second Second Kings 23. Again in Second Kings, I want to say uh, chapter 24, verse 3. I'm talking off the top of my head, so you'll have to look that up. Just look up Manasseh and you'll find it. That is what happens here at syllable 133, which you've heard now so much that you probably can't forget it, I hope. All right? Temple goes down. I mean, the temple was already down under Titus. But now a pig temple's going up above it. You get that? That's abomination of desolation. So Paul is tying to the original Solomonic temple going down like Manasseh due to Manasseh. I mean, due to all Israel. I mean, Manasseh put temple prostitutes in the temple. I think that's in the Second Kings 24, 3 passage. It might be in the Companion Chronicles passage on Manasseh. There were temple prostitutes living in the temple. Temple prostitutes to other gods, okay? It was really bad what he did. So it's a parallel to what happens here. Okay? You see, Paul's being real specific. He's telling you the history is going to be that bad. He's drawing a parallel to Manasseh via Isaiah, which Daniel also does at the same juncture at Daniel syllable 182, which is technically on the Solomonic period. But Solomon was, was giving into temple prostitutes too. He didn't put them in the temple. But he was allowing he was allowing temple prostitution to go on outside the temple, which is mentioned. I forget where it is, but it's somewhere early in Kings. All right, that was one of the things that that Solomon got wrong, and why Jeroboam was going to get the kingdom away from. That's why Jeroboam was offered the kingdom after Rehoboam came to power. Okay, and of course Jeroboam, you know, turned to idolatry also. So this whole thing is about idolatry. And what's happening here? Well, an idolatrous temple is being built atop the real Holy of Holies. And of course, there's an abominating dome. Duh! Can Daniel 9 be more advertised? We got a dome of the Muslims sitting above the Holy of Holies right now. You see the parallel to today? It's pretty pregnant, huh? All the while, we are still in the 91, baby. 91 was supposed to be when the rapture happened. 91 was supposed to be when the tribulation began. And we are still on the verge. We are still in Daniel's 62nd week. Tribulation hadn't happened yet because the 62nd week has not closed. We're still in that time bubble. And the 91 is telling you that. I'm beginning to see how clever all this number play is. So now you might be saying, well, okay, I get the fact that it has to be connected to Rome. I get the fact that it's got these numbers in the pregnancy thing. Okay, oh dear God, I hope I'm still recording. Yes, I'm still recording. Okay, but you know, can we get back to the text, please? Okay. You've gotten the point that it's pretty depressing from here on out, right? This was all nice and chirpy. Worthy of God, you know, and this is Christ's own biography at this point, which terminates us roughly here when he's in heaven, and then he takes all of the Old Testament people from paradise with him. That's going to be in Ephesians 4, 8, and 9. <coughs> so we have our blessing in the heavens with those living in the heavens via him. You got that. You got that he's 56 now. You also got that this is the future going forward. You got that this is persecution. You got that this and this is persecution. Okay? You got that this is when the tribulation was expected at the outside, the very last date. And therefore, Paul is trying to tell you, hi, we're still in the 91. 91 AD was when the 50 years would have been up had Christ died on time, but he died seven years early. That gave rise to these earlier potential rapture dates okay and at the outside was 91 which would have ended there 
and Paul skips right over it to 94 because the rapture ain't going to happen. But by the way, we're still in a 91. It's first quarter. It's pregnancy. It's 9.1 months. And here are the generations being generated. And they're not voting well. Right? You got all that. So at this point, how many times have you heard it now? This is when everybody starts politicizing. All the different versions of Christianity and Judaism start politicizing. There's a lot of cannibalism. In other words, they're fighting with each other as well as fighting against, you know, Jews against Christians, Christians against Jews, everybody going to the Roman procurator and trying to condemn the other guy, you know, all right? Hatfields and McCoys. So notice this is where Paul starts to get real specific about what it is we have in Christ. I mean, this is pretty general here. God is worthy of praise. He's blessing us. Okay, but how? Every blessing, well, that's all nice and syrupy. Okay, it means a lot more, as you'll see if you read the notes to these verses, but it's still generic, right? It's generic, it's nice, it's chirpy. There's a lot more to it, but still, on the surface, it's generic. Oh, we're blessed in the heavens. Well, yeah, but what about right down here? Right? And he elected us. Oh, that's good. I have a future. I don't have to worry about being saved. We were in him before the founding of the world. Well, that's nice. When I'm dead, I'm blemish free. But right now, you know, I don't feel too good. Before him by a standard, okay, please have the rapture come now. That's how everybody was feeling. Because they didn't understand any of this. So Paul starts to get real specific now. And he's going to need to because this is where the persecution really steps up. So far, it sound, you know, there we go, 91, latest rapture date, latest beginning of tribulation. By means of love, he foreordained us. Okay, I'm going to live on that, but, you know, I really don't understand what it means. Okay. How about huyotesia? And I started to talk about that a little bit before compared to the emperors who are dying. You know, this is when Trajan dies. All right, the emperors who are dying, it might not have been this close, it might have been a little bit later than, but it's definitely just after this, because I think uh, Hadrian comes to power on 117 or before. All right, how about, how about airship? That meant a lot in the Roman world. Okay, that meant you were rich. That meant you had control. That meant you could, you know, if you had enemies or something like that, you could do something about it. Okay, heir with Christ. And of course, Paul's been talking about that all along, and so has everybody else. So here we go. We are baptized into Christ as heirs. Baptism was the theme in Romans 8, and Paul is evoking it here. Okay, into him, her father's own delight in his own will and purpose and it still seems kind of vague okay well what is that Eudokian anaphora starts here okay when they they might not get it the first second they see the word Eudokian they're gonna get it the second time Tutelematosautu his own will and purpose in other words all this stuff that's going on we sin means something it's a plan. He's got a plan. It's his own purpose. And it's into Christ's own sonship. Well, even if you don't know what it means, you know it's a big deal. Okay. Into the praise of the glory of his grace. Now, praise is a really crappy word. I'm sorry. Epinon means a good report, but it, it means you're representing the person you're reporting. That's talking back to Isaiah 53, 1. Who is believed our report? This is what Paul's addressing now. In other words, he's telling you, hey, look back, because he's already told you several times now that he's talking back to Isaiah and Moses. So you're already looking in those chapters. Okay? So when he hits you with a pine on, everybody knows that means a good report. That means a good reporter. That means somebody who has the office of being a reporter. That means somebody who has the authority to say. And what is the authority to do? 
glory. Huh? We? Me? Now? Down here? I'm not dead yet. I am representing, because that's what, that's what this means, good report, your representative of the glory of his grace. And of course, you know, everybody knows that's the theme of scripture and other verses. But here he's presenting it as an asset. Uh, that Think about that for a minute. Now, my pastor spent a lot of time on this in a different, using different, uh, a different verse. But it's the same idea. He kept harping on us. Look, you represent Christ down here. You will be taken care of. And I had a lot of training in diplomacy, which I didn't want to use. And that's, that's really true. Your country, which is, you know, heaven, hello, you're an airship with Christ, so I belong to heaven. Heaven's going to take care of me because you know what? i got to represent the glory of His grace down here. That's an asset down here. I don't have to die to get it. God is going to be responsible for taking care of me. Now, it doesn't mean I go sit on a park bench and just wait for the money to fly into my hand. But it does mean that I don't worry about anything. I am a representative of the glory of His grace. And that's true for every single one of us. I don't care how apostate we are. I don't care how low we are, how high we are in the eyes of the world. We are entrusted with the praise of the glory of His grace. I mean, that's really a high office. And, and this was really important to say, the cultural tie here is in the Roman Empire. You didn't get an office like that unless you were related. You had to be related to the imperial household. You had to somehow be in the imperial household. Hello, what is this? The heir got to represent, you know, in other words, Titus was the heir of Vespasian. Okay, beginning back here. Okay, this is the year of the four emperors. Titus was the heir of Vespasian. You know what, I might be a little off on my timing here. Because you got Vespasian taking over. I don't think he lived very long, a couple of years. And t I think both of them were dead by this point. But Titus was the heir of Vespasian. Titus was the guy who, who you know, ransacked the temple. He was the heir. He got to represent his dad, Vespasian, on official obligations. His dad didn't go everywhere. Okay? He got to represent him. Well, what's Huiotesia? It's sort of a soft TH. You don't aspirate it. Huiotesia. Sort of flick your tongue in the back of your teeth. Well, you're representing your dad. Well, it's the dad who made us into sons through Christ, who is the son. And we represent the kingdom of heaven. So we are taken care of by the kingdom of heaven. That's real meaningful to put that first because this is the time of the persecution. Resulting in or into, you know, resulting in is really what I wanted to get into because it, the praise of the glory of his grace is, is the result that God has in mind to praise his son. That's the whole purpose of verse 6. But at the same time, we are actually baptized into the sonship. And that's going to be awfully important to people who are walking out with the clothes on their back from Jerusalem. You know, a whole lot of Jews would have believed in Christ because they, they, Christians were, were leaving too. There were a lot of Christians who stayed behind. And as they're leaving and they're, you know, being raped and they're being pillaged and everything going on, and they're saying, you know what? I got this. I still got this. I can lose everything else, but I'm still a son. And then they could explain the scripture to the Jews who already knew the Old Testament scripture, but they might have, you know, disdained reading Ephesians. I still got a purpose in my life. It's like the Psalm 119 death march. Only this is a lot shorter. This is only a few verses instead of like 118 verses. Look at how deft it is. 
And then, you know, you got the next 14 years, turn around, new generation. He's graced us out. I'm graced out. I have this office, this office of representing the glory of his grace because I get to represent him as an heir. Again, you didn't in Roman society in particular, but Greek society also, and really all over the ancient world. You had to be related to the royal family to represent them, even if you were distantly related. Okay, it was a, a loyalty issue, and it was also a qualifications issue because you had to be raised rightly and all that. Of course, that's why we have the Bible, so we know how to learn how to represent him properly. That's your first office. That's the first sign of your sonship, is that you represent him. Which means he's going to take care of you. And, of course, that's what this says. Typical Greek style, when you want to really emphasize something, you double it. See? Charitos, echaritosen, echaristosen. I can't do it right today. I've been up for 36 hours or something. Okay. With grace, he graced us out. So now you're going through the period here that's coming up on Commodus. Ending where everybody else, especially those who are negative, are going to end their years with a sigh. That's uh, Psalm 90 verse 9. But you are saying, in whom we keep on having redemption. On account of and through his blood, debt cancellation. And I spent a lot of time, I'm going to go through the document on this. You've got to go look up the redemption asset because I can't cover it in the video. It's too vast. I, it's a whole class of assets all by itself. And then a subset of it is debt cancellation. And this is how you should translate a face in. They usually say translate it forgiveness, but it means to forgive a debt, especially a gambling debt. You know, you gambled and you bet on sin and you, you bet wrong. So, afesin ton paraptomaton. Okay? In my bad Greek right now. Because I'm too tired to say it right. Debt cancellation is what afiemi means. Okay? And that's the word right there in the Greek. And that's how you should translate it. So, see? Because you're being taken care of, any debts that you incur were already paid on the cross. That's not, that you have to name your sins in time. And that's why you can have debt cancellation. If you don't name them to God, you're, you're pretending you're not in debt. You go into debt doing the sin in time. Holy Spirit's not going to fill a defiled temple. That's why this temple has a pig temple on top of it. Because the Jews are not admitting that they're wrong. Okay, so if you don't admit you're wrong, you've got this as an asset that you can use, First John 1, 9. If you don't use it, honey, it's just going to sit there as an asset, unused. This is a bank account. Redemption is the grand, you know, this is actually a credit card. This is a bank account, and debt cancellation is what happens when you use that credit card. Why? Because Christ paid it. Debt cancellation is an asset you use. So you see, at the very time between here and here, when Commodus comes to power, when the, there was a step up in the persecution of Jews and Christians, that's when Paul rolls out the assets. You're a representative, he's graced us out, and by the way, that's a redemption asset. Redemption means that you're redeeming something in time. Again, you've got to read the, the verse 7 note on this, see? Redemption. Apolutrosen. Read this note. Right now it's on page 28. But as you can see, you could just click on, <coughs> excuse me, verse 7, and read it. And I go through what I'm just telling you in more detail so you can think it over. And then, your next asset is debt cancellation. That's a fund that you use when you use 1 John 1 9. It's, a, it's an account. It's like really like a credit card. 
that you never have to pay back because Christ paid for it. But it's an account you have to use, and if you don't use it, honey, the Holy Spirit's not going to fill a defiled temple when you're in a state of sin. And you'll never understand Scripture if you don't use one child one night. And that's what Paul's talking about here. And I go through that in a little more detail in the, you know, in the note to verse 7. So that's where I'm going to stop right now. Just in the historical timeline, understand that there was a parallel drawn by Paul between 133 when the temple is raised, when the pig temple goes up, in the time of Commodus, when the religiosity of the Roman church solidifies. Okay? Bible interest goes to an all-time low in this window. And so God judges. But at the same time, sending into the diaspora the people, they have to rethink everything. And meanwhile, Rome remains apostate. But at the same time, a whole lot of people are going into the diaspora elsewhere. And they're learning this grace. And they're remembering they have redemption. And they're remembering that cancellation. Meanwhile, in Rome, communist comes to power. And that's what we'll pick up the next time.